Okay, so this is going to be an exam past paper question walkthrough for the transition metal topic for AQA, A-level chemistry. Now, this sort of theory is going to be applied to every single exam board. So if you're doing Edexcel or OCR, you can still take advantage of this question breakdown, but this is specifically for AQA. This is from an AQA past paper from June 2017 paper one. So what I'm going to do is jump straight into this then. So solution A contains the compound copper H2O6 Cl2. So what do we have here? We have a aqueous copper water molecule complex with two chlorines attached in some way. So first question then is to state the type of bonding between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Okay, so pause the video, think about this for a second, think what is the bonding occurring here? Now, this is where they're actually trying to trick you, okay? So I'm gonna draw one of the bonds here for our copper attached to our water molecule. Now, within this complex here, there's going to be six water molecules, but I'm just going to focus on one right here just to save me some time. Now, if you've been revising the transition metal topic, the first bond that is going to hopefully pop into your head is going to be coordinate or dative covalent bonding. However, that's not actually the case here. The coordinate bond is this one right here between the central transition metal and the ligand attached. But what we're concerned with is the bonding between the oxygen and one of the hydrogens within the water molecule. So simply this bond right here. Okay, and all this bond is, is a covalent bond, a shared pair of electrons. Okay, so they're going to try and trick you, and most students, I assume, would just chuck covalent, I'm um, sorry, coordinate on the page, when in reality, it should be simply covalent. Okay, now it's not going to be hydrogen bonding, because that would occur between two molecules of water, not within one molecule on its own. Okay, so next question then. State why the chloride ions within this compound are not considered to be ligands. So all we have to think to ourselves here is what is the definition of a ligand? Okay, so a ligand is an atom, ion, molecule, anything like that, which has a lone pair that it can donate and form a coordinate bond with. Okay, now is chlorine doing that? No, it's not. We already have an octahedral complex here. So the chlorine is not able to form a dative covalent bond. So in that case, then, we can simply write that the chlorine ions do not form coordinate bonds. So they do not form coordinate bonds with the copper 2 plus ion. All right, easy as that. So only a one mark question, but that is the principle behind it. Okay, so next question then. An excess of ammonia was added to a sample of solution A to form solution B. Write an ionic equation for the reaction that occurs when solution A is converted into solution B and state the color. All right, so transition metals, massive pain. All right, you just have to remember all the equations involved all the, the minor caveats, as well as the color changes, okay? So this is one unique to copper. Try and remember this. When we have an aqueous copper complex and we're adding an excess of ammonia, can you remember what happens? What sort of reaction is taking place? So what's taking place is actually incomplete or partial ligand substitution. This is just a unique case you have to remember. So let's draw out the equation then. So we're going to be having our copper H2O6 aqueous complex 2 plus. Keep the charge in there, it's very important. Now, in this reaction, if this was, for example, a cobalt or something like that, we would react with six ammonia and have complete ligand substitution. But with copper, we only have incomplete when we react it with an excess. So we're going to be having four ammonia molecules and this will substitute the four water molecules, okay? So what we're going to be having produced is, uh, this is NH3, isn't it? NH3, four of those guys, and then two water molecules remaining. And then we're going to have four of the water molecules being kicked off.
okay? And that's our equation right there. So just try and remember that caveat when it comes on to copper and you should be fine. Now, why is the color change? Okay, now you may be thinking to yourself, wait, hold on a minute. He didn't include the chlorines, why is that? Now, these are chlorine ions. So technically it's two lots of this attached to the aqueous complex. So all that's going to happen is that this is going to be a spectator ion on either side of the equation. And therefore we can simply remove it from both sides and we would not include it. Okay, so that's the that's that point out of the way. Next is the color. So as I said, you just have to remember all these colors. Now this is going to go from a blue solution. All right, this guy right here is going to be a blue and it's going to become a dark blue uh, or a deep blue. Okay, so I'm just gonna think deep sounds nicer. Deep blue makes me think of the ocean. Um, or you can write royal blue, that's another option as well. Okay, so that's our three options for our colors there. So question 7.4 then, aqueous sodium carbonate. So let's think of that, about that for a second. Sodium carbonate, this was added to another sample of solution A to form a blue-green solid, okay? Identify the blue-green solid C. Okay then, so essentially what we have to think here is what is occurring? So our sodium carbonate, if we write this out, sodium carbonate. Now, when this reacts with our copper aqueous complex, the carbonate is going to react where we're going to be getting a copper carbonate. Now, if you just remember all the different colors and the precipitates and the solutions which are formed within this topic, you should be fine with this. Just remember that it's a blue-green solid. What is reacting? Okay, it's got a copper complex reacting with a sodium carbonate. Therefore, our product is our copper carbonate. Okay, that's going to be our product here. So pretty easy one marker as long as you've gone through the process of flashcards, of colors and equations for this topic. Okay, so next up then, 7.5. Reagent D, all right, we don't know what it is, we have to identify it. This was added to another sample of solution A to form a yellow-green solution. So we're getting a pattern here, okay? Colors, colors are crucial to the transition metal topic. Go through Anki, go through Quizlet, learn your flashcards for these colors and it will be so helpful to you and you can get as many marks as possible, okay? So we have to identify reagent D, Write an ionic equation for the reaction that occurs when the yellow-green solution is formed from solution A. Okay, so yellow-green solution then. How can we form a yellow-green solution from this complex? Do you remember? All right, so that would actually be the formation of our CuCl4 two minus complex. So if we write out that equation here, I'm going to sort of do this question in reverse. I'm going to write out the equation and then simply identify the reagent afterwards. So if we start off then, copper H2O aqueous complex two plus plus, now chlorine ions, these are too large to substitute six. So we're not going to be getting an octahedral complex. We're going to be getting a tetrahedral complex here because their molecular mass is too large. Their size is too large. So four of these guys is going to have a ligand substitution here. And we're going to be producing CuCl4. Now the charge overall is going to change. If we're adding four lots of a minus to a two plus, we're going to be getting a two minus charge. And then all six water molecules are kicked off and substituted, so that'll be our full ionic equation. Just like before, okay, we don't need to include the chlorine ions because they're spectators. All right, now which reagent would we use for this? Now, if you just put chlorine ion like this, this is gonna be incorrect, okay? We don't want that. When asked for a reagent, okay, you want to include the full compound of that reagent. So the, the key example I would just remember would be HCl. Okay, hydrochloric acid. Now any soluble um, chloride salt would be fine as well. Sodium chloride, potassium chloride, anything like that is fine. Anything that can supply the chloride ions and be soluble in solution would get you the mark there, but HCl is just a go-to one. Okay, next question then, 7.6, the last question here. Explain why colorimetry cannot be used to determine the concentration of solutions containing CuCl2 minus complex. In your answer, refer to the electron configuration of the metal ion. So they're giving you the marks right here. They're telling you how to think about this question, which is quite useful actually. AQA is never normally that kind. So 
electron configuration of the metal ion. So our metal ion here, if we see you, we've got our CLs, okay? Now, what they are telling us is, and we've got an overall charge of minus one, okay? So what is the oxidation state of a chloride ion? Halogen, or halide I should say, therefore is simply minus one. Okay, so if we've got two lots of minus one, that's going to equal minus two. Therefore, since our overall charge is minus one, how do we get to minus one? We just plus one, okay? Which means that our oxidation state of our central transition metal ion is plus one, okay? Now, electron configuration. What is the electron configuration of a one plus copper ion going to be? Okay, so... First off, let's just think of what the electron configuration of our copper atom is going to be. So when it has zero charge, it hasn't lost any electrons. So, so I'm going to ignore the start and just focus on our d suborbital and our s suborbital. So we're going to have 3d10, so we have a complete d orbital here, and we're going to have 4s1. Okay. Now this is for copper. When it is uh, oxidized to our copper plus ion, this S electron is going to get lost before we lose our 3D. So that would mean that our electron configuration for our copper 1 plus is just simply going to be 3D10. Now with colorimetry, it's very important that the wavelengths or frequencies of visible light are absorbed. Now, if we have a complete D suborbital here, we're not going to be able to absorb and excite the electrons as, as in a partially filled D suborbital, okay? So if we write this out, our response is simply going to be our copper plus ion has a full 3D suborbital. Therefore, it is unable to absorb the wavelengths of visible light. So therefore, it cannot absorb wavelengths of visible light. And what does this mean then? If it's unable to absorb the wavelengths of visible light, it's therefore unable to reflect and therefore it has no color. So, and so, is colorless and that's going to be absolutely useless for colorimetry so then that's all the questions covered here six questions how many marks in total we've got one two four five six seven eight nine so nine marks here not too much working as long as you understand the theory behind the topic remember the color changes remember the equations you should be all good to go if you learned something, if you found the video helpful, be sure to like the video. It really helps the YouTube algorithm work its magic. Subscribe for future chemistry content. Best of luck in your upcoming exams. Peace.